it's out for lunch. Um, I think it was 74 degrees last night, so we're working on it. <laughs> uh, so there's going to be a copy of this stuff out there. Um, next, we're really excited to have Sonia Chernova come and talk to us about some work that's going on with um, robots and learning. Um, and she's going to talk to us about attraction and reliability. Thanks. All right, yes, please take advantage of coffee if you need. <laughs> Uh, so it's actually, it's great to go right after Andrea because she's done all the motivation for me uh, and I can jump into some more details. So this is a lot of fun. Um, so I'm at Georgia Tech and um, there I'm a, let's see if this works. I'm a director of the Robot Autonomy and Interactive Learning Lab. Um, and what our lab works on primarily is this interaction between users and robots in particular and robot learning, kind of the, the whole goal of this uh, or one of the goals of this workshop. Uh, is to discuss this topic, right? And so there's a lot of um, work that happens on the bottom here in this lear robot learning component, right? And we have, a, we have seen a lot of talks uh, in that. And my lab has done um, work in this space, trajectory-based learning and, and task learning and um, you know, combination of high-level learning and low-level learning, which is kind of a, a, an interesting interface to be at. Uh, but what it, we spend a lot of our time thinking about is actually not just this bottom block, the learning box itself, uh, but these arrows, these interactions and this fluid space between the user and the robot. And there's a lot of really interesting questions, I think, to ask at that space. Um, how do we provide, how do we users provide demonstrations to robots, the mechanism by which we convey that information? And it turns out the way that we convey that information on the powers that we give to the user actually significantly influence the effects uh, and performance of the learning algorithm, even if you keep the learning algorithm the same, the inputs really change how uh, the algorithm performs. Um, what examples do users choose to give? So again, this is a kind of a nice follow-on um, on Andrea's uh, discussion of how, you know, how do you um, pick what aspects of the demonstrations to provide, which keyframes or whatever else. Um, how, do we, how does the robot interpret demonstrations? So now I'm kind of getting closer to the robot component. How does the robot actually understand not just the demonstration itself in terms of you know, X, Y, Z coordinates, but the intent of the demonstrator. A lot of the time um, when we teach, we actually have broader meaning in what we're trying to convey. And then there's kind of the upward arrow, right? Because this is not a one-way process from the user to the robot, the way a lot of people think of it. This is a two-way road, right? And so that we have to also think about what can the robot do as an active learner? What questions can it ask? Right? Similar to how children, when they learn, they're very, very active participants. Um, when should the robot interrupt? So how does it time these questions? Because anytime you ask a user something, almost always it's an interruption. Right? You're taking some cycle, some brain cycles away from a human. Um, doing this too often is not a great idea. So when should we time those questions? Um, and how do we correctly phrase our questions in order to elicit the correct amount of information? So these are really, to me, really interesting questions that exist kind of in between, right? They're not really part of the learning box. They're not really part of the user alone because they, they span both worlds. Um, and so these are the questions I want to talk about or some of them that I want to touch on today. Um, so I'll talk about three different things. The first is a, a series of projects. I won't, I'll just gloss over some of them, but it's a, it's a series of projects we've done over the last few years on remotely controlling robots and having remote uh, human teachers, and I'll explain why they're remote um, and what kind of interactions we're looking at. And this is part of this downward arrow, looking at how do we get demonstrations from users as well, how do we learn from those. Um, next, I'll talk another piece ooh, uh, about downward, this downward arrow, looking at uh, semantic reasoning and interpreting demonstrations correctly, some of that intent and high level reasoning that I'd like to pull in to this learning problem. Um, and the final one uh, is part of this return arrow from the robot to the user. And I'll just talk about a recent project we've had on figuring out the timing of asking questions and the interruptibility of users and whether we can learn to predict uh, when we should interrupt different people. Um, so I'll start with the first one, our web-based um, remote interaction work uh, that we've done for a number of years. And, and it's a very simple picture that um, captures the project. We have a robot. Here it's pictured as a PR2, which is the robot we started with. We've now moved on to several new platforms since then. Um, but we want to make this robot be accessible to users who are not graduate students just within our university because those are not the typical population we're interested in. We're interested in working with users who um, do not necessarily have robotics experience, maybe are not as technical as computer science majors who typically come to our user studies. 
Um, and so what we want to do is make this robot online. And of course, when we are doing this, you know, crowdsourcing is huge as well. So that's a whole population we'd like to tap into. Get more data because LFD, Le robot learning from demonstration typically is starved for data, right? It's very expensive to get to have people come in uh, and, and give demonstrations, both in terms of mostly because of time, right? And, and the ex main expense is, is time. Um, and so we wanted to make our robot available through the web uh, in order to collect data more easily. And of course, we're not going to have people install complex uh, robot control software on their desktop every time they want to use it. So. Uh, what we did is develop entirely uh, an interface that's entirely in the browser, which I'll show you examples of in a second. Um, and so now we have a framework that enables anyone across the world to just open up a browser, go to a particular website, and have whatever level of control we allow them over the robot. So that interface is actually with the nav stack, so for navigation, interfaces with the manipulation perception components and so on. So we can, we can decide how much control to give them. Uh, this is, these are all open source efforts that uh, support this and this robot web tools, which actually does the brow uh, all the browser plugins in particular has been a big collaboration with Chad Jenkins, who moved from Brown to Michigan recently um, and, and back when Willow Garage was around. They were in and out and so on. But it's still alive. It's, it's still, I'll show you kind of the recent uh, interfaces from that. Um, so this is the framework. This is the idea, right? So a, I'm not going to talk about how the, the kind of the ins and outs of the system uh, aspects of how we got this working, but I want to show you some of the effects and what we can do the, with it. Uh, for very quickly, uh, I guess before I go there, I'll say that it's, it's grown beyond our lab. Uh, this is uh, from a recent IROS paper showing uh, robot web tools running on five different devices. And the, the fact that it's now in the browser allows you to interface with users using lots of different devices um, across the world. And, and this does, NASA's uh, picked up on it a little bit and had some of their robots in it as well, which has been a lot of fun. Um, but here's an example of um, one of the first studies we did. This, was, this is actually the second study we did uh, using this kind of interface. And I like to show it because it, it, it gives you an example um, of an interface right, right off the bat. So this is a browser screen, and this is what the user sees. They can be anywhere else. They could be here at Berkeley, right? And our robot is somewhere else. And this is what we see in the lab. These are not synced up, but this is basically what we see. Our robot's standing there, moving its arms, moving its head, doing stuff. And the users are controlling the robot, and they get a, a camera view. The robot actually has about seven different cameras, so they can switch between all of those. There's a wrist camera and so on, so they can get different uh, views of whatever they're doing. They also have this 3D model that can be helpful. And what they're doing uh, here is picking objects up. This was a, a, a simple study. You can see this, um, it, it's disappeared for a second, but this, it, this is called an interactive marker. It's a six degree of freedom um, ring and arrow marker model that allows you to position right, the end effector, the gripper, in different locations. And what users are doing um, is picking up different objects. And we've structured this as a game. This is a gamified study. We found that ended up really helping um, for a variety of reasons, but we're giving people points and we're having them pick objects up, as many objects as they can in a fixed amount of time. Um, and the reason we're making them, having them do this, which for them is a game, and it's kind of fun because they get to play with a very cool, interesting robot, is on our end we're learning uh, 3D object models and grass models at the same time. So given just this, right, we get um, perception data from the robot. The robot has uh, both a Kinect camera and a, a panning laser uh, scanning laser here that allows it to build 3D models of the objects it sees on the ground, or not on the ground, on the table in front of it. And each time somebody picks up an object, the robot remembers what that object looked like and where on that 3D model the gripper was located at the time of the pickup. So that's, that's very simple. So each example gives us one partial view, right? It's an object from this way, this way, this way, this way. And if we take all those examples and we do an iterative point cloud registration process, right? We can build a full 3D model. Given enough samples, we can build a full 3D model of that object, onto which we then can map the grasp locations, where the gripper was. Um, the users are completely oblivious to this process, right? They are playing a game. Uh, we're getting this nice data. And the nice thing about it is these models can now be uh, mapped uh, to, so if you see an object in the world, right, you can compare it to the models you've seen before, and that provides object recognition in 3D, uh, but more importantly, it provides a place for you to figure out where to put the gripper if you wanted to. So 
Uh, it, it, it was a simple way uh, to, to perform this object recognition and grasping process. Uh, now, a lot of the data that comes from the crowd is, is noisy, right, in, in all crowds of sourcing, and including with robotics. Um, and even despite our best efforts, sometimes the robot thinks it picked something up and it didn't. And you can see if you watch, uh, that one ended, but if you watch any of the videos, I can restart, um, you can see there's failed grasps, right? And so some of the models that it's learned, the, the grasps were not appropriately mapped. Um, and so what we do after some number of examples from a human, then the robot goes on its own and tries some of these grasps out, ranks the resulting grasps, and in the end, when it's done, following this training process, we get very close to 100% uh, performance in picking up a, a variety of objects. Yeah. Do you have to worry about the fact that two users might take sort of different trajectories in accomplishing the same task, and then uh, if you end up uh, imitating it, you don't get exactly the one or exactly the other, and the sort of middle ground is not so good? That's a, that's a really important question. So the question was, if People give different, very vastly different demonstrations that accomplish the same goal in different ways. And averaging them doesn't necessarily make sense. Now, in this case, we're getting around that problem by only remembering the grasp location. So as Andrea already showed, the actual trajectory is, actually, is not very good, and we're ignoring it here. We're, we're retrieving only the endpoint, and when we have to generate our, it ourselves with the robot, we just rely on planning. Okay, so we plan through that trajectory, and we throw it out here. But you're completely right, and to me, that's a really interesting uh, research problem that a lot of um, algorithms ignore in this community, because in, in, our, in the way if humans behave, we have different ways. We just have different preferences. Um, and so there have been a few attempts at clustering and a few attempts at other stuff to be smarter, but, and certainly there's an awareness we shouldn't just average. In this case, we're just planning. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the, night, the outcome of the study was kind of this, this kind of um, result that we had comparing a, a robotics graduate student in training the object recognition algorithm for a set of objects and random crowd users. And so my graduate student is in red, and he does really well. But the blue, the user study participants are sometimes better, sometimes worse, but statistically um, indistinguishable from him. And this is really one of the few, few studies in this field where we get a result that says, okay, you know, a trained grad student who does this all the time performs roughly as well as, as a random crowd of people. Uh, and that's partially because of the way it's been designed uh, because of this refinement process that we go through. But it also shows that um, if we just have access to more data, right, even if some of it is noisy, we can filter it out. Kind of the, the whole benefit of crowdsourcing does filter down to the robotics uh, world as well. Uh, there's some uh, uh, kind of outliers on this. This was an object not picked up by vision ever. Uh, this, this was a, aspect, <laughs> a negative aspect of gamification. We had a little toy truck with wheels, and if you failed to pick it up, it would sort of you know, it was hard because if, you, if the robot bumped it, it would roll away. Uh, and so people, because they were playing for points, um, they just didn't, didn't demonstrate this one. They, they were like, okay, any of the other objects are a lot easier. They're not going to move. Uh, and so this one didn't end up working in the user study because they didn't provide enough data. So um, that's something we would, we would redesign uh, or give more points for this one next time if we were to do it again. Um, but in, in any case, this was a promising kind of early stage study. Um, and then we went on, we had this goal, so this is a different robot, this is a, a Jayco, as you've seen in several of the other talks. And we had this goal of creating a really complex domain and moving from pick and place to much more complex actions. And we would get the crowd to, t to show the robot how to do all kinds of complicated things, open all kinds of puzzle boxes, um, containers, all kinds of things. We would record all that and learn from it. And we had, we even had this kind of mock idea of what it would be like, and we had a major roadblock. And the major roadblock was that, that ring and arrow marker that I showed you that looked like this for controlling the gripper requires you to specify the gripper location in six degrees of freedom. Now, this is the most standard interface used most widely in robotics. So DARPA Robotics Challenge <laughs> teams used it. It's the standard thing that comes with ROS. Um, but as far as getting naive users, <coughs> inexperienced users who are, again, not graduate students, but just off, 
first time using a robot, getting them to do complex tasks like solving various articulated object um, puzzles or just to, to, to move things or even to just with precision grasp something ended up taking way too long and, re, uh, and having significant number of user errors and missed grasps. And in the end, we couldn't actually do any of the learning because we, what we were recording was um, just users' frustration and they w did not want to stick with it very long. Um, so we had to back up and we had to look at better ways of, of, of getting data from users in this remote setting. And this, this goes not only for LFD, not only learning from demonstration, but for all robot control, right? How do we remotely control robots more effectively for something other than just picking up an object and putting it down, which is which I think where most of robotics is focused so far, um, and we've gotten we've made some good progress there. But we want really more precise grasp. So here's a an intermediate set of objects. These are not the hard ones we originally planned, but there's some still some challenges here. Okay, you've got to grasp a particular handle on these plastic drawers. This is, this is a little box designed for preschoolers. It's, it has a very small lip made for little three-year-old fingers um, to open and slide the box to make it open. We have a cup full of pens we need to extract a single pen from. We have things we want to pour out or unscrew and so on. And so we said, okay, let's, let's work on an intermediate problem. Can we design interfaces that work here before we go to uh, more complicated domains? Um, and so we conducted a study comparing three different interfaces. And so um, there's kind of two contributions that we have here. First, the interfaces that uh, we've now added as well as um, the study itself. So uh, this is the traditional uh, ring and arrow marker that I showed you before, right? So this is our baseline. Uh, and again, it has six different things you can control, right? Three for position and three for orientation, right? Um, and so to pick up an, the object, and I'll show you a video of it in action yet again. But this is, this is our baseline that we're comparing against. Um, the next one um, is something called, we call constraint positioning. It comes from the CAD community. So we went out and we looked at how other communities outside robotics deal with this problem. Um, in the CAD community, this is known as a Navidget, uh, which we thought was a, an unusual name. So we, we went with constraint positioning. And the way it works is you click on the object that you want to pick up. And then the rest of your interactions, for the rest of the interactions, your gripper is constrained to work on a sphere bounded to that, centered at that object. And so now you've reduced, you've constrained your problem, right? You've reduced some of the degrees of freedom. And all the user is now controlling is the, ang the approach angle by moving along the surface of the sphere, as well as the, um, how far off the, the gripper is and its rotation or its orientation. So that's kind of intermediate. You go from six to three controllable degrees of freedom. And the final interface is something we call point and click because that's literally all you have to do. You click on the object and the robot autonomously recommends some grasps. It tries to infer what you meant in terms of uh, interacting with this object and you just get to pick the grasp. Now the way this last one works, real quick, I'm gonna have to don't have that control in this um, screen, but uh, this is building off something called antipodal grasp identification and learning that comes out of Northeastern, out of Rob Platt's group. So here's a visualization of it. Given that little wooden box I showed you for preschoolers, if you click on it, the algorithm uh, analyzes the surface normals around the place where you clicked. It analyzes the surface geometry of the object in 3D space, right? So you click in 2D. The user only sees this in 2D. But the algorithm has a 3D scene from the connect, analyzes the surface normals. It's hard to see where the lip is here, but the algorithm can figure it out. And it, so it recommends, it predicts, it has a classifier um, that predicts where the best locations are to place the gripper in order to, per, to perform what's called antipodal grasp, right? So we, where, that would pinch um, from two sides and make contact with the object. And so what Rob Platt's group has produced a method that's called Agile to calculate these graphs. We've kind of extended it in our work and made it interactive. So having said that, let me show you um, a study that we ran with 45 people recently comparing these three algorithms. And this is the web browser interface that they saw. Again, this is remote users. They're using a browser-based interface. And what's going to change between study conditions is this middle section of what they're seeing. And then th these are the controls for 
once they have the grasp, they can pull and push objects in different ways. Um, but this is the first, uh, it, the first interface. This is free positioning. And it's going to uh, show you, in all three cases, opening the drawer, right? And this is the, so this is the ring and arrow, what it takes to carefully position uh, to open the drawer. Now, this is the only interface where we're giving users also 3D data. Because we feel it's advantageous to be able to do this in 3D, though it's a little bit more expensive to stream it. Um, you'll see the under, other interfaces are actually easier to look at as well, because they're just 2D. Um, and so here you can see most of the time is spent refining this last bit, which is actually important, is how to align carefully. Um, and your field of view is kind of limited, your depth perception. Soon the user is going to be happy with it. And when they're happy, they go, OK, move arm, go ahead. And, and so then the arm plans autonomously to that grasp location. Does that make sense? And so now the gripper is closed. This is just show, an overlay showing you what happened. And then they say, move back. And the arm is going to open the drawer. So that's what it takes to, to do one grasp. Okay, This is why we couldn't do harder actions. Uh, here's the other interface. This is the uh, Navidja. This is the constraint positioning. You click once, you get a sphere. You click a second time, it places a gripper on, on the outside of that sphere. You can then tweak that virtual gripper, position it. But it's constrained. It's always going to come towards the place that you originally clicked. And so that element of depth perception that you're otherwise missing is going to be automatically taken care of by the algorithm. Because even though you're clicking on 2D data, I guess I should mention that the algorithm feeds on 3D data, right? Because it, it understands how far, how far away that object is. And so you just saw, I, I didn't even get to finish talking, and the drawer was already open, <laughs> right? Um, and then finally, point and click. It's going to take a little longer in this video because we're going to take the time to show you all the candidate grasps. But in reality, it's very, very fast. So you click, you get a grasp, and they're ranked uh, by their, mo their most likely uh, best performance to worst performance. It's usually the first grasp that's actually the best. And then you go ahead and say go, and you get to open something. Um, so this has been fun. This has been a really fun project because we went from something that was very, very frustrating to use, the six degree of freedom kind of that's the standard in the field uh, up to now, um, to something that was actually much more usable and, and much more user friendly. Um, and when we ran the user study, it was really nice to see a performance between these algorithms that um, the more work people have to do, right, the more degrees of freedom they have to specify. Uh, the greater the number of interactions of per task, right? And this is every single click that they have to do. There's like over 100 clicks. Now, some people just like clicking, right? They, they tweak the camera lots of times and so on. Uh, but it takes more work for them. And the number of tasks being completed in the fixed amount of time that we give them goes up as the interfaces get faster to use and as the error goes down. Yeah? So are there differences in how hardware dependent the different approaches would be? They're, they're not entirely. So you, as long as you have 3D data, they're relatively hardware independent because you're just specifying a point, right? And so from then, you need, just need the planner. Um, where we think it's going to need maybe some blending is if you have an object that's really not being picked up well by 3D uh, vision, like very shiny objects, for example you will not get very far with point and click if the surface of that is reflective. So there you're going to have to fall back on free positioning and just rely on the human entirely. So if you fail, if the 3D sensor fails, you do need that fallback. But any time it is working, it looks like it's much better to go ahead and rely on it. And just to, to show where the, all these improvements are coming from, this is the number of errors per task per task. So we had, our user had four tasks total. So number of errors per task um, that are happening to these users. And when they're doing free positioning, which is in blue, you know, there's really a number, and most of these errors are coming from misses. So they're just missing. They're trying to grasp something, and they're missing. OK. Um, so, this is, uh, so this is kind of where we are now. This work is going to be presented next month. Uh, at HRI, and we're just finishing up a follow-on study just to, to kind of study these interfaces in more detail. Uh, but once we can do this, we, we can now very comfortably do the, a, a table like this. 
we can now, our plan is to move to harder objects or more objects at the very least and start looking at actually learning from the demonstrations we can now finally get from our users. Now, speaking of those demonstrations, if we go back to this kind of big idea, um, all these demonstrations occur in objects, right? We're, we're largely in this space looking at people manipulating different objects, not so much the trajectories that we've seen before, because especially over the web or even in other applications, the, the trajectory itself is hard to get. It might be too noisy, uh, both because it's on the web, but also in kinesthetic teaching, as, as Andrea showed. Um, and so what we want to do is start to think about objects themselves. Is there something more we can get from objects if, um, if than just the you know, color properties or so on? Can we think about objects at a higher level? Um, and so for this, I'm going to back up and talk about work that's not in robotics first, and then I'll um, jump forward to how this connects to robotics. This was uh, work we first did on analogical reasoning. If you remember those standardized tests in high school that you had to take that were multiple choice, um, chair is to table as, you know, something is to something. Uh, th those are analogical reasoning questions, right? They, they uh, test your ability to, to capture and understand analogies. Uh, and a few years ago, we were interested in studying these. Um, and what we did was we took pairs of words, fed them into something called ConceptNet, which is an MIT database of common sense knowledge, and tried to uh, parse this gigantic graph that has millions of edges. Um, or subgraphs of that large, large graph in order to understand the relationships between words. Um, and our goal of that particular project was not just to be able to answer this kind of question. So here's an example analogy question. Custom is to society as hypothesis is to evidence, or et cetera, et cetera. So you should try to figure out uh, what the right answer is. Um, so the goal of the, our project was not to just understand what the answer is, which has been done before. By the way, the answer is D. Um, but to, more importantly, generate an explanation. And this is kind of the next step for an AI, right? It's, this is an automatically generated sentence that says, this is the right answer because society is based on customs and a game is based on rules. Okay? And on this level of understanding is important, not just so that we can make random connections, but we can start to get to the next level of reasoning as to why this similarity uh, relationship holds. Okay? So this was, a, we had a lot of fun with this project answering all kinds of uh, multiple choice questions, SAT questions, and so on. Um, and uh, when we finished, we thought, well, this is a cool system. It can do all this. But who cares about answering multiple choice questions? What's the practical application? Um, and we went back to, the, to this diagram and said, well, this whole framework really feeds on words, and in this case, pairs of words. But we could take away these words. We could take the, away the analogy questions and put in something else. Um, and in this case, we said, OK, well, for robotics, there's a whole set of uh, planning domains, for example, hierarchical task networks, other planning formalisms, where the plans are in regular English. Right? There's actually a lot of recent work on reading recipes online or like the WikiHow websites and being able to turn those into robot tasks. Those are human readable. They contain words. What if we take those words and we analyze them and we think about relationships? What can we do with that? Um, and it led us to a project on uh, object substitution where we tried to understand, um, the, given some task, how we could fix it if something was missing. Um, let's see if this works. Carl, uh, add my school back. So here's a quick demo of, of, of the final, uh, one of the final uh, videos from that. So here we have a robot, and it's going to, has a task that it knows about. It's not learning the task itself. It says, OK, pack my school bag. It needs a notebook. So it's carefully going to pick up this notebook, put it away. Um, and everything's going to go great until we tell it to pick up something it doesn't have. So the next task is to find glue. Um, and what the robot's going to do here I couldn't find glue. Can I substitute tape? Yes, go ahead. And so it recommended to a substitution here. Uh, and the substitution, there's, there's several steps I'm skipping here, but there's understanding what glue is, understanding the, the sense of the word glue, because a lot of our words in English have multiple senses, to understand the context that's being used in this, in this um, task and what other candidate objects could be used instead. 
Once the user said, yeah, you, you don't have to ask the user. We just do it as part of the demo here. Uh, and then we also show you what happens when it asks about uh, in, inaccurate things in a second. Uh, so it got some glue, or it's got some tape. Next is to get pencils. Can't find any pencils. I couldn't find a pencil. Can I substitute a quill? <laughs> no, that's not useful. <laughs> Can I substitute a pen instead? Yes, go ahead. So without grounding this information that exists from this uh, database that we get off of MI out of MIT, you get things like Quill, which in theory is the correct implement, but in practice is, is not going to be found in most households. Um, and that's easy. We, we could filter that based on the robot's vision. Um, we could learn user preferences as well. So for example, here we are going to have a user preference. I couldn't find an apple. Can I substitute a banana? No, I don't like bananas. <laughs> Can I substitute an orange instead? Sure, go ahead. And so here, we're, this is a different uh, kind of error where the substitution that we were trying to make uh, was just not liked. And you know, the, the user didn't prefer it. And so here. All finished. Nice job. Mm. All right. So here we have um, a quick example of how analogical reasoning, which is exactly in the same variant we used before to solve multiple choice analogy questions, can now be used in this very, very different context to substitute objects in similar situations. Um, this, also, this project was also a lot of fun, and we kind of ended up building on it and, and liking the semantic reasoning aspect that it created. Um, but we also wanted to expand it a little bit beyond just similarity of objects. Um, and we, we ended up starting this project over sort of afresh, looking more broadly, instead of just pulling words from plans, also pulling them from vision. Uh, using a larger set of databases, not just ComstNet, but also WordNet, ShapeNet. Uh, we might potentially grow beyond those two, uh, those three. Uh, these are the ones we're using uh, in the foreseeable future. Um, and then taking, given all this data, to create something we're calling in a situated affordance network, which combines this type of high-level abstract knowledge, <coughs> like a quill is a writing implement, right? with grounded, situated information that says, well, yes, but I don't have quills, but I, you know, this user likes to use pens. Or high-level information that says, says, well, in general, people keep spatulas in drawers. And you know, the specific environmental information that says, this user likes to keep spatulas in a giant metal cup on the counter. Right? And so this is. This project, where it's what, what it's grown into in this case, is an attempt to recreate something we as humans do really well, which is the, to balance our uh, situated local observations and our habits and our understanding of a local environment with this abstract knowledge that um, we're also aware of in terms of general. So if I come to your house and I need to find a spoon, I'm probably going to start opening drawers in the kitchen, but I'm not going to go open drawers in the bathroom nor am I going to open the cabinets in the kitchen. Right? There's certain priors that I have for locations of objects. There's certain priors I have for what containers are and how to use them. Um, and that's where we're going with this. Now, this is a very early stage work. I don't really have a lot of results. Um, in this case, we also do object uh, disambiguation here, or word sense disambiguation. We've switched to a more probabilistically driven model. We use uh, Bayesian logic networks. Uh, the logic, uh, first order logic components, adding some of the transitive properties we need for our evidence set. Um, it's giving us a little bit more uh, different kind of flexibility than we had by just leveraging uh, ConceptNet. Uh, we get good inference so far on kind of um, simple types of queries. We get uh, roughly 85% uh, accuracy in a lot of queries uh, just without using situated information so far. Um, and then kind of the, where we're pushing right now is to incorporate this low-level observations that we get from the robot camera up into that model in order to do that actual blending. So um, we don't have results on that yet, but this is uh, work we're currently uh, applying. And once we have this information, what we want to do is actually look at, in the context of learning, for example, if, if the human demonstrates something to do with cups or containers or drawers, right? How do we not just take them literally and say, this is a trajectory I've learned just for this one object? How do we generalize? How would you use our understanding of 
well, this is a type of container, or this is a type of fruit that goes with other fruit, or this thing is made of metal just like these other objects. How do we learn, use that information in the context of learning? Um, and so the other, one last thing I want to say about this is that uh, some of this information, uh, I've mentioned a lot of it comes from perception, some of this information is going to come from humans, from having to ask human questions. Um, and that brings me to this final project I want to briefly talk about, which deals with this upward arrow of having the robot initiate or, or, or take actions um, or ask questions of the user. Um, and the, this particular project deals with uh, interruptibility and the timing of those questions. Um, and so there's been a lot of work in many communities on you know, gesture recognition, activity recognition, and so on. In this case, we're looking at models of interruptibility recognition, where we define interruptibility as basically the inverse of workload. Right? How interruptible are you? This is something we t take so much for granted as humans. Right? If I see you standing in the hallway talking on your phone, even if you make eye contact with me, I'm not going to just come up and start talking to you. That's not socially acceptable. Right? And uh, for those of us with little kids, like this is something that they don't quite understand until they're a little bit older. Uh, and you have to say, OK, I'm on the phone right now. Uh, but over time, with enough examples, um, humans become incredibly good at this. And we want to look at making, giving that same power uh, to robots. And there's been a little bit of work in the community before looking at how we can take a few person descriptors, like um, pose, gaze, direction, and so on, <coughs> to get at the idea of something similar to interruptibility or workload. A lot of it happens with instrumented humans when they're wearing accelerometers or something else. Um, and in this work, what we're doing is leveraging, again, I, I kind of have this uh, deep interest in objects and, and belief that objects carry a lot of semantic information. Um, and the fact that you're holding a cell phone to your ear really does mean something, right, in terms of understanding your interruptibility. Um, so this is the first work we're aware of where we've expanded, uh, not only have we defined more concretely some of these m interruptibility measures, uh, but also added this idea of uh, objects and, and their importance in, in providing context for that interruptibility. Um, so very briefly, interruptibility is going to be rated on a scale. Four is very interruptible, like go ahead and talk to this person. One is don't talk to this person. They should not be interrupted. Zero is we don't know. We see a person there, we don't know if they're interruptible. Uh, and so this is a, sort of like a Likert scale that we're going to be mapping onto. Um, so far, we've uh, done it in uh, a variety of these settings. We're doing a freeform study next month uh, to look at it in more complex interactions with um, people engaging in a broader variety of tasks. But here's a, a bunch of images that I would like to label each of these people with their interruptibility, right? And they're purposefully picked from the same environment because it, even within the same environment, you know, this guy is talking on the phone, this one's working on his laptop. This one's drinking coffee. This one's chatting. They all look very, very similar, right? It's, but in many ways, um, we look at for not just at their location, but some of the other social cues that pick up on their interruptibility. And we want to give the robot the same ability. Um, so what we did was we took a robot, has a connect and a laser. Uh, we coded up a whole bunch of features that we can detect autonomously. Uh, from the robot, the position of the robot, uh, of the human, their uh, face direction, gaze direction, uh, whether they're talking, whether there's audio coming from their vicinity, things like that. Um, and what we've ended up training, we've, we tested a number of models, but uh, we had really nice performance with a latent dynamic CRF. So traditionally, the work in this community, uh, community has worked at HMMs, um, but we, we did some, we looked a lot at the gesture recognition community. Uh, because there's some an analogous problems in that space as well. Um, and so this, this model for latent dynamic CRFs ended up uh, representing this problem particularly well because it uh, models the, both the extrinsic dynamics between the different interruptibility levels as well as the, the intrinsic hidden, um, hidden variables uh, that are captured within this model that help uh, to achieve better performance, particularly as some of these um, 
extended features, so we tried different sets of features just to see what, how it impacts performance, especially because some of these other ones are particularly noisy. Um, and the model, some of the simpler models like HMM struggle when we add uh, some of these more noisy features. Um, but really quickly, so we compared HMM CRFs, hidden CRFs, and um, latent dynamic CRFs, uh, of which latent dynamic really, really dominate. And here is the a confusion matrix of interruptibility um, resulting from the LDCRF model. And what we can see from that is we are very, very good at classifying um, most of the interruptibility levels. It's relatively difficult to, to figure out what level three means, which is pretty interruptible, <laughs> but we're not quite sure. We, that gets confused with um, both ways as, as with a two and a four, so you, you tend to kind of have an error. So people, people that are very, very uh, clearly not interruptible, we really understand that, okay? As, as, as we kind of get towards the more and more interruptible, the algorithm has a little bit more problem. I'm sorry, maybe I missed it. What's the ground truth again? The ground truth, no, I didn't mention it, so. Are people being bothered, you know, or, they, or how, how are you, you know? So the ground truth in this case comes from um, labelers who are not us, not authors on the paper or related at all to this project, coming in and labeling what they think on, on a scale of one to four, how interruptible each of the people in the image is. And uh, so we did this with several labelers and, and then compared, uh, did a correlation test of how much in agreement they are. And it turns out that they are extremely very, very well aligned and in very much in agreement. So what we found is that humans, the, this data collection is staged. Um, and then the next one that we're running next month is not staged. Yeah. But what we found is that human labelers on this data are very much in agreement on the level of interruptibility, which we weren't sure it would, would be the case because it's kind of a, uh, you could view it as a varying opinions on, on what interruptibility could mean from a social setting. So this is data, this is data without, by the way, using any of the objects. I said we are, one of the things we wanted to try was adding objects for context. Um, and so here's data when we add objects. So black, the black shapes are different amounts of data, training data without objects and gray, which I guess is harder to see here, um, it, it, but it's always higher, is, um, are the results when we add objects into the mix as a feature, as a, um, and this not, not perfect object recognition, there's a roughly 10% error rate in the object recognition, but even so, um, it adds significantly to our, to our ability to estimate someone's interruptibility. Um, and so here's an example of the results on those images. So we see um, this person working on a laptop, even though we see their face, they have interruptibility one. These folks who are basically looking straight at the robot, um, have an inter uh, are very interruptible. They look like they're ready to engage. Uh, this one on the cell phone is interruptibility one. Interruptibility zero for this person that we see, but we, that we, their back is to the robot. They, we don't actually know what their state is, um, and so on and so forth. So we get, um, generally, what, what right now, if we, if we were to use this directly to influence the robot behavior, what we would get in situations like this is the robot would address the person facing the robot straight on and be aware of the other two people with their backs to the robot, but not attempt to talk to them as if there was somebody else present who was looking directly at the robot, which is the correct social dynamic kind of to, to, to play into. Um, so this has been uh, interesting work. As I said, we're going to extend it into um, unconstrained, un kind of, uh, uncontrolled, more uncontrolled settings to test it more in the wild. Um, but the way it fits into this bigger picture, as I said, so coming, kind of coming back and tying all the pieces together, we have a lot of different questions and a lot of different projects addressing different aspects of learning that I've talked about. This last one was about when to ask, when to interrupt people with questions that robots have about learning something or asking for help about something. Um, we have projects on how to elicit that information in, in different ways. I talked about how people can demonstrate, right? And we have um, different ways of interpreting their demonstrations or in the information of the, their demonstrations and so on. Um, right now, these are all disjoint projects. And I think that's characteristic not only of our lab, 
Uh, but of the robotics field in general, that we tend to have these projects be niche projects that look at different sub um, subfields or sub problems independently. Um, and our hope in the near future is to start connecting some of these up, right? So that these demonstrations combined with the semantic knowledge about objects um, can influence learning. That the robot that's learning can now start to figure out when to interrupt different people to ask for help and so on. So we'd like to see more crossover between these, which is kind of where our lab is heading uh, in the future. Um, and here's a quick um, list of all the students who have been contributing to this work, students and postdocs. Um, and thank you for listening. And I'm happy to take any questions. So that's one of the things we'd like to be able to do with it, is to generalize something that was demonstrated in a specific object to other classes of objects, so whether they belong, whether the class is uh, oriented along the property lines, that these are other metal objects, or this is uh, another, another fruit or you know, category or whatever else. Um, so that's one thing that I'd like to do. The other is that in a lot of cases, this is cl closer to what we saw with the video of the robot packing a school bag Robots end up with policies that work, but as soon as the environment changes, they, something changes and, and that policy just doesn't apply anymore. And that typically happens when objects are missing. Now, if you're cooking something, you know, you're supposed to mix something or you know, you're missing a spoon, you're just gonna grab some other thing, like a fork or even a knife to mix something real quick in order to add the ingredients. Humans are amazing at improvising in this way. We don't just stop and say, okay, I'm not gonna have dinner because I can't stir my pasta with a, with a, without a spoon. But that's currently where we are with robotics, is that if there is no, you know, if there's no way to perform this policy, there's really very little adaptation that happens. And so the other end that we'd like to look at this from is from the adaptation perspective. How do we repair um, plans? How do we repair policies? in order to allow for greater generalization. So it's along the same lines, it's still generalization, right? And, but instead of from a single demonstration, looking at how to repair as well. And so the objects um, in the network would have to be annotated with features that, um, that would sort of influence how um, so, so that's the, so the question is, does, do, do the objects have to be annotated with different features? And that's exactly the thing we're trying to avoid, actually. So nothing so far has required hand coding on our part. Um, we can detect certain properties from vision. Uh, we can even have tactile information. We're working on a project with tactile sensors to detect the, whether something's metal or wood or plastic. We can do that. Um, but the, uh, you know, we can also ask humans, but we don't want to get into the habit of just hard coding all this information for every single object we want. And so that's where all these resources like ShapeNet and ConceptNet and WordNet come in, because a lot of that information has been encoded for other communities other than robotics, computer vision, and so on. Um, and we're trying to pull data in from them and leverage it there, because then, even if you encounter something new that no, nobody's ever hard coded, you have at least something to go on. It tends to be noisy data, it tends to be incomplete, and overly general, I would say, right? So we get information that for a single cup, our network tells us it's, it's probably ceramic and metal and plastic and wood. Like, it's not all those things at the same time, but it's still, it gives us a prior, and then we can refine that prior and, um, based on our observations. So, but we're trying very hard, and, and so far succeeding, not to have to hard code any of the features for a given object. That's very important. <laughs> yeah. Good question over here. Yes. Um, so two things. So one, it seems like you know right now the interruptibility <coughs> task is a binary task. You know, do I approach person X or Y? But it seems like 
you know, I, I mean, maybe there's something more that, that I didn't see, but it, it seems like, you know, some tasks, uh, you'd, you'd want to uh, gauge how much to interrupt the user, right? So the, the, so the training task itself is, you know, so you could ask them to do a very involved task, or if they're like on the phone, you could ask them to do a very small task, you know, the same way that we gauge our responses, you know, yeah. like how, how available is this person for labor or training, right? So yeah. that's, that's one question. The second has to do with this idea of, of kind of implicit features. I mean, is there any attempt to use kind of ambient uh, human substitution patterns, right? So like the likelihood that, you know, so for example, my kids watch you know, these craft shows and like cooking shows, and people are like constantly in these shows essentially engaging in um, substitution mm -hmm. activities, right? Yes. Uh, and so rather than, I mean, it seems like there's a lot of passive data uh -huh. even there that's uncoded, but which is actually, yes. you, know, feed, feed, you know, because the idea is like, are, you know, how, what are the vectors along which people are making com uh, relevant comparables, conditional and context, is something for which th there's actually potentially enormous amounts of I think that would be, uh, so I'll, I'll answer the questions in reverse order. Um, I think that would be really interesting to learn from observations for what you count ambient kind of evidence, right? Uh, watch YouTube, have the robot go watch YouTube videos, so can it go uh, watch cooking shows? Can it watch people in its environment and obtain information now? I think the goal is yes. Um, it's not, uh, we have a partnership with a vision group that's going to look a little bit into that space, but it's, it's so much of a perception problem more than, you know, that if you, if it becomes like core perception, right? Um, so, but ultimately, yeah, as we get better at <coughs> having robots observe from a distance that the information that they need to glean, I think that's an, an excellent way to get more data. Uh, right now, robots really need to be a little bit too much in your face to observe you, right? So the passive is kind of in your personal <laughs> space a little bit uh, because of the range of 3D sensors and so on. Uh, to answer your other question on interruptibility, uh, I did present it entirely as a binary problem, do you interrupt or not? But the scale actually, we, we're not thinking of it as entirely um, inform, is the only thing that's informing that binary decision. And that it doesn't even have to be a binary decision. I think there's a lot more beyond this interruptibility scale that we're providing. Like how urgent is the robot's task, right? The building's on fire. But you're not very interruptible because you're on the phone. I'll just let you burn, right? That's not, that's not really a valid, uh, right? And so we ha there's a lot, of, a lot of other factors that need to be considered. Um, but, and then we could also extend it to not being just binary, but smaller interruptions have less cost than larger interruptions. I mean, it could get much more complicated, I think. This is just the precursor that says, based on vision, let me just get your state. I know my state. Okay, the next question is, what do we do from, from that data, so. Okay. Great, thank you.